Hey guys, so today we are answering a subscriber question and the question in question is Frederick, what are the grace areas between good quality code and bad quality code? So let's get into it. This is a very good question and it's one of the toughest questions that you... Uh, it's, it's a very tricky thing. And I will give you the best answer I can give you to this. And some of you may argue, are going to agree and some of you are not going to agree. And without sounding too pompous about this, I think that this is the sort of question where hopefully my answer can give you a bit of a hint to distinguish a person with experience with, from a person with almost no experience. So let's get into it. The, the thing I'm going to say here is that I will argue that the gray area between good code and bad code is the inherent complexity of the problem that you are solving. Let me explain. So a junior will quite often think in terms of extremes. In other words, they will, and not just a junior, there's quite, I'm sorry to say there are a few seniors who think this way as well. <clears throat> they think about good engineering as being equal to adhering to good practices or being able to write elegant code. And the sad fact of the matter is that this is only possible if the problem that you are solving, well, allows you to solve things in a efficient and elegant way. And that is a big problem because it's very often that you can't solve that sort of problem. I'll give you a scenario. You create a, you start, you start working on a greenfield project. It's supposed to support, as an example, one of the most complicated problems is multiple markets, different, like an international product. So you start working and your first set of requirements require you to be able to, you should create an interface for an API of some sort and the API is going to work in a certain way. You sit and you pour in hours and hours and hours into just designing a nice REST API with like API keys and then you set up interfaces in your server code that follows like you have the different markets and you're using polymorphism of course <clears throat> and uh, you're creating a generic solution that can take in a request and process the information and do all the good things right. You ship that. It is poetry. Like it's absolute poetry. It's the best code that you like, you want, like you really feel satisfied with the solution right. And then you, sh you, you ship that and a new customer comes in and talks to your business people without your knowledge, of course. And your business people come in and with a big smile on their faces and they say, hey, we have this really, really big client, but uh, they're not really happy with how the API works, so we need to change it. And you kind of go, okay, what do I need to change? Um, well, you need to add these keys here and you can't just like they need us to contact their service as well as part of this request here because if we don't like they need to make a synchronization and then they're going to pass us a value that we need to pass back to them as an ID for that request. And you go, but no, this is going to, this is going to make the code quite hard to maintain. And then your business people go, oh yeah, that's, that's a shame. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit, but I mean, this is a big client, we, we need to sign this deal. And then you realize that you're not the most important person in the world. Uh, your engineering doesn't matter for, for matter. It doesn't, if it stands between your engineering like, and the business, it's, you're never gonna win. And then you just hang your head low and you start to shim in this new requirement into your perfect, flawless, beautiful code. And this is where a, uh, the distinction between a good software developer, I guess a senior experienced person and a junior level or a person who thinks in extremes is going to come in because when you're done, you're going to feel dirty about it. And you're going to, I said, the, the more junior you are, the worse you will feel because you now perceive your flawless software as just being kind of bad. You now it's, you know, it's bad software because you're very likely going to have to create these one-off solutions for that specific customer. And trust me when I say this, then you ship that and then the next customer comes in and says that, no, no, we need this, we, we, it needs to work in this way. And you have no control over this. It can happen at any time. And it's why I keep on telling everybody that it is vital that you never try to be too clever up front because you have no way of knowing if your code will turn to shit tomorrow 
all, and the only thing that, can, that needs to happen is that someone comes in and says, now it needs to work this way. This is the problem with software development. If you build a car and somebody says, no, we need a, we need a different car, it's going to work in a, similar, in a different way or it's going to look a different way, then you usually build a car from scratch. Software development doesn't work that way. You change what's already there in order to accommodate things. And that is, as you can imagine, an, a recipe for disaster when it comes to good engineering practices. Because it's impossible for you to, at every step of the way, foresee what's going to happen tomorrow. You have to make some assumptions, right? Well, the better you get, the better you get at actually foreseeing these sorts of things. And that's why I th sometimes juniors and seniors can come in into this little argument about good practices where the juniors, they simply haven't had enough time to gain the experience to know that the solution that the senior wrote is actually more scalable. It may not be as perfect and like generic and abiding by the best practices that this junior has kind of thought about. But from an experience point of view, it's actually very likely that this will, although not as pretty, going to scale. It's going to be sustainable for a longer time. And this is why I argue that the gray zone between good software and bad software is, it is, it is that exact spot. spot. Good software is not the best code. It doesn't necessarily be, mean that you wrote the best code that is possible to write. It is about f having that perfect sweet spot where you wrote an implementation that is good enough, but also has the potential to accommodate changes in requirement without causing a lot of issues. Because if you have a flawless piece of code that works in a very specific way, and someone comes in, as I said, and just changes your interfaces, depending on your solution, you might actually be in a much worse situation than you would have been if you had gone with a more pragmatic approach to solving this problem that can absolutely, that absolutely, that could scale. So that is, uh, that is the way I think about it. It's, uh, you mean the inherent problem, like the problem that you are solving is going to be the limiter and the difference between good and bad software in this, in this area is basically just that if you write really shitty software, you're not going to be able to handle these new feature requirements. And even if you wrote perfect software at that point in time, it's still going to be shitty software because as soon as the requirement changes even the slightest bit, your perfect architecture starts to make less sense. And it just has to happen a few times until the whole thing becomes this kind of weird mess where some part of the system is, like the first part of the system is very nicely well made and it works exactly as it was supposed to do. And then you have all these other permutations and weird corner cases that you need to support that just becomes an ugly mess and becomes very confusing. While as if you had had a more holistic mindset in the beginning of things and wrote things in a more prag pragmatic way, in other words, accepting that you don't know what the requirements are going to be, you would very likely have designed it in a way where it may not be perfect, but it's going to like make sense for a longer period of time. So what I want you to take away from this is that the gray zone between good and bad software has very little to do with how perfect you write something. It has to do with how sustainable your solution is. That gray zone is, is basically, because as I said, it's sometimes writing something that from an engineering perspective isn't the nicest thing in the world is a requirement. Like you can't get around it. They, the customer's requirements are what the customer's requirements are. So you need to figure out a way to write a solution that is going to stay simple and sustainable for a long period of time. Even if that means not writing a perfect generic like best practices solution. If you can do that, that's great, but it's very rarely that that is how things go. It usually starts with you making a set of assumptions about something, and then as the product evolves and becomes more stable, finally the business people will start coming with less of these one-off solution requirements, and you will start to see a pattern in the way that your company works. And then you can start thinking about how can we make this into one of these perfectly, perfectly engineered solutions. Very, very often people go about it the wrong way. They start trying to do that and then they write something that becomes very tightly coupled, very well defined and whenever, and then just anything comes in and, wants, uh, and needs to change and they simply can't accommodate that change because they thought about their software as being this one unit of a deliverable that never that's a, as an immutable thing and it's not immutable guys it's never immutable software always changes have a great day